Sherwood College Ministry. I'm Bryce. And I'm Noel. And we've got some announcements for y'all tonight. Uh, first of all, this coming Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., we're going to have services. Be there. Also be at the College Small Group at 10.05 a.m. We want to see you there. But, be there. But, not only this coming Sunday, but next Sunday, you know what that is? That's Friend Day. Come, bring a friend. Do it. Do it or else. Um, hope y'all enjoyed us slapping each other. <laughs> And then after that, uh, we do have Harvest Rome 2022, which is uh, this coming November 5th. There's going to be kind of like a collab of all the churches in Rome. It's going to be a lot of fun, about like 10,000 people there. Um, and uh, there's going to be food trucks, vendors, um, heard a rock wall, just a ton of artists, music, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of like a festival. So definitely come to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. And um, other than that, that'll about do it. So let's uh, go ahead and stand to our feet and get ready to worship.
was awesome. It is so great to be worshiping with y'all tonight, praising our Lord, singing thanks to him. Y'all, it's not just in song though, y'all, it's also in the word. Um, and today, um, Porter asked me to read um, y'all Psalms 27 verses one through six, and they are just absolutely beautiful. Um, starting in verse one, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life, whom shall I fear? When the wicked advance against me to detour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though armies besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war breaks out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, and this only I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to gaze upon his beauty and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of my trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent that he sent me on top of a rock high. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to my Lord. Y'all, that is so beautiful. Will y'all join us with one more, two more songs actually.
Jesus, thank you so much, God, for how great you truly are. Lord Jesus, you are so worthy out of all of our praise, out of all of our devotion. God, thank you that we are able to gather together, God, as your children to worship you, Lord. God, I'm thankful for each and every person in this room because you have them here for a reason. God, I pray as Porter comes and brings the message, God, I pray that you would speak through him. God, that it would be your words and not his. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts to you. God, move how you want to in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for being here tonight. Um, I am very excited because I missed you guys this summer. Uh, I missed doing this exact thing uh, this summer. I missed that a lot. So I'm excited to be back. I'm excited for all of you guys to be back. Um, as you can see, this fall, we're going to be going through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, so that is going to be our sermon series. If you would like to go ahead and turn to our passage tonight, it will be Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and turn there, um, that would be wonderful. So our series is the Sermon on the Mount. We are talking about uh, just kind of this concept of living in the kingdom of God. So throughout the book of Matthew, uh, there's a common theme, there's a common phrase that's used over and over and over again, and it is this, the kingdom of God. Um, and we kind of define that as the rule and reign of God both now and for eternity. Uh, so Living in the kingdom of God is something that we do here on earth, and it is also something that we will do after we pass on and live with God in heaven. Uh, so it is something that we're doing right now and that we will be doing later on. But in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus kind of gave us a, a foundational teaching, kind of some guidelines of this is how you're going to live in the kingdom of God. This is what it's supposed to look like. Um, so that's what we're going to be studying this semester. Uh, we are skipping over on Thursday nights. We are skipping over the Beatitudes. Uh, so that is uh, verses 1 through 12. But that is because on Sunday mornings, uh, our Sunday morning small group class is going to go through the Beatitudes. Uh, so you'll get a more in-depth study of those because you'll go through one each week. So you'll get a more in-depth study of the Beatitudes than I could uh, offer you on a, a Thursday night in a single sermon. Um, and then that also gives me more time to cover all the material that's in the Sermon on the Mount uh, because there's a lot packed in here. But it's going to be an awesome semester of learning. So we're starting out with Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, the passage about salt and light, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. But I want to kind of let you guys know why we are studying kingdom living, why we're studying the Sermon on the Mount. And it's born out of a desire within Christians to be good citizens of the kingdom of God, right? We don't want to just be half-hearted. We don't want to just be lukewarm and partway in and partway out. No, we, we want to be good citizens. We want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, at the end of our lives. So that's the goal here. But here's the thing is, we don't really know on our own, we don't really know how to be good citizens of heaven, right? We don't really know how to do that on our own. You hear the, the phrase all the time, you don't have to teach a child to be selfish, you have to teach a child to be generous, you have to teach a child to share. Um, I think that is very valid. Any of you that have younger siblings or like young cousins or something, you can probably affirm that that statement is very true. Um, Abigail's giving me a big thumbs up over there. She knows. Um, but here's the thing. I don't think that that illustration only applies to children, and I also don't think that it only applies to generosity. I think that it applies to people of all ages, and I think that it applies to any area of morality. For a couple examples, I, I did not need to learn how to lust, but I did have to learn how to be pure and how to pursue purity. I did not have to learn how to be lazy, but I did have to learn how to be disciplined. I didn't have to learn how to hold a grudge against somebody, but I did have to learn how to forgive them. And I think that all of you guys can probably say the same things. So what we're left to see is that on our own, we're not great at figuring out how to do this whole citizen of heaven thing. 
So we're going to study these, uh, these three chapters of the Bible so that we can learn how to do that, how to be good citizens of heaven. The first lesson that we're going to learn tonight, um, the first lesson that we're going to learn about kingdom living is the reality of responsibility. That's what I've titled this sermon is the reality of responsibility because uh, every Christian is required, is responsible to be what God created them to be. You as a Christian are responsible to be what God created you to be. And there are going to be three responsibilities wrapped up in that, in that concept and in that statement. Um, and that's what we're going to find tonight. So I'm going to read the passage. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to dive in and learn those, uh, those three responsibilities. So beginning in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Dear God, first of all, we thank you for your word tonight. God, we thank you that you have been gracious enough to give us something that is objective, something that is not changing, something that we can read and we can study and we can understand what it is that you want for us. God, we thank you so much for that. I thank you that what you want for us is our good. God, I, I thank you that the things that you desire for us are for our good and for your glory. God, I thank you that your design is where human flourishing is found. And I pray that tonight as we study this passage that we see that more and more. And I pray for each of the people who are in this room that you would use your words to correct and encourage them to live as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So the metaphors that Jesus uses in this passage are very domestic. And what I mean by that is they're very easily understandable. So uh, everybody has salt in their house. Everybody uses light in their house. Like these are things that people use on a daily basis. These are, pe these are things that people um, at this time period used on a daily basis, right? No matter how rich they were, no matter how poor they were, they used light in their homes and they used salt in their homes, Two very common things. So what that kind of shows us is that this passage is easy to grasp, and Jesus wasn't leaving any group of people out when he's teaching this. All right, and so remember when he is teaching this, um, Jesus has, uh, there are some crowds that have been following him. His disciples are with him. And so he goes up on a mountain. His disciples follow him. It's pretty likely that the crowds were listening as well, but he is primarily speaking to his disciples in this passage. Uh, so he is speaking to Christians. And so therefore, if we claim to be Christians, then this d applies directly to us. Um, but so our first responsibility, the first responsibility that we are going to find is be different. Responsibility number one, be different. Jesus lays out two very distinct groups in this passage, and it is you and the world. Those are the only two groups of people mentioned. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are and the earth, you and the world are the only two, uh, the only two people groups found in here. Now this, this, found, or this distinction between God's people, the church, and the rest of the world is foundational to the entire rest of this passage and the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Because it is very clear that there is a difference between God's people and between the rest of the world. Those are two distinct groups. I also want to point this out. Um, Jesus does not say, uh, you become the salt of the earth. You become the light of the world. No, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So what Jesus is giving the disciples is he is giving them an identity. He is giving them an identity in him. As he says, you are the salt of the earth. As he says, you are the light of the world. 
So this is both an empowering thing and a, and a weighty thing, right? It's empowering because Christ looks to us and he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are what's supposed to preserve goodness on the earth. You are the light of the world. You are what is supposed to illuminate the world with hope and with joy, right? That's empowering, because the spirit of Christ lives in us and that's what he calls us. That's how he identifies us. That's awesome. But that's also weighty because we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Nobody else. Only us. Only Christians are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And that comes with some responsibility so here's, here's our, our, in our first point, kind of the application of be different is simply live out what you are in Christ. I want to give you just a little bit further of an idea of this in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, in verses 1 and 2, it says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's what it says in verses one and two. But now let's look at verses eight through 10. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this fully acknowledges, okay, you were once this, you were once dead in your sin, but look at your new identity in Christ. Verse 10, you are his workmanship. If you've been redeemed by him, he has worked intently on you and he has set before you good works, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We weren't created to remain where we were. We're not created to go back to being a, a slave to sin, to go back to being dead in our trespasses and sins. But no, we're saved from that. We're given a new identity as a new creation and say, hey, let's go do some good works. Let's go be the salt of the earth. Let's go be the light of the world. If you're a Christian, this is what you are. You're not what you used to be. You don't have a choice. If you're a Christian, you don't have your choice of your identity. This is your identity, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, so own it. Uh, a commentator named John, John Stott about this passage, he wrote and he said, we serve neither God nor ourselves nor the world by attempting to obliterate or even minimize the difference between the church and the world. When we try to make those two things look the same, we don't serve God because that is trying to make him look like the world, saying that he needs a makeover. We don't, we don't serve ourselves because we're simply lukewarm and trying to find some middle ground between the black and the white. And we also don't serve the world because they don't get to see the glory and the beauty of the gospel. So be different. Responsibility number two is this, preserve goodness. Preserve goodness. Uh, there were a couple different uses of salt. So this is directly in reference to verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. So salt had a couple different purposes in this time period. Um, they're very similar to the purposes now. Um, the primary one was preservation right, preserving things, usually specifically food, so that it will last longer and not rot as quickly. So preservation, uh, seasoning, and purifying were, were the primary uses for salt. Um, so when we, when we look at that, how does, how does that apply to us? What are we supposed to do with that? How are we supposed to understand Christians being the salt of the earth? Well, we are supposed to preserve goodness in the world. That means that we are responsible, one, to live good, Christian, obedient, moral lives on our own, right? That is a responsibility that we must take on ourselves to live moral lives. But it's also the responsibility to teach others to do the same. 
Meat rots on its own, <clears throat> right? You, ca- you can't blame it for rotting on its own. The question, if you were to find some rotten meat with no salt on it, the question wouldn't be, what's wrong with this meat? But the question would be, where's the salt? Where's the salt? So, and that's what we have to be to the world. We have to be what preserves goodness because the world does the same exact thing. When left on its own, it decays. All right, if, if you want to question me on that, look at the moral condition of our world right now. Take a look at that, and you will see very obviously that it decays when it is left on its own. And now, I also want to note that preservation is a negative action, right? So we're going to see that preservation is a negative action. That's the the action of salt, is to prevent something from happening, to prevent uh, decay from taking place. So it's a negative action, um, and kind of how that plays out in this world is when we are the salt of the earth, when we practice being that, we might not be super popular. We might not be the coolest people around. We might not be the most liked people around. But that does not mean that we should not stand up for righteousness and stand up against unrighteousness. We still have to do those things. Because that is how we act out our responsibility as the salt of the earth. So um, I was watching Instagram Reels the other day. Uh, Okay, so there's this thing, like, people are trying to say that Instagram needs to stop trying to be TikTok, right, with the Reels. I saw a bunch of stuff about that the other day. Um, But I'm completely against that movement. I think Instagram should keep the Reels. Because here's the thing. I don't want to download TikTok. I want to watch Instagram Reels and see TikToks a week later than everybody else, and I'm okay with that. That's right. Yeah. There we go. Um, But so anyway, I was watching an Instagram Reel the other day, and um, it was this girl. So this couple is engaged. They post a bunch of cute videos or whatever and stuff. And so the, the girl gets a spoonful of salt, and she's, like, been cooking something, and there's, like, some pasta sauce. And so she gets a spoonful of salt and then just covers the salt barely with some pasta sauce. And then she goes up to her fiancé, and she's like, hey, I want you to try this because, uh, like, I, I don't cook very often, so I just want to know, like, how it tastes. And so, obviously, like, he just goes in and gets a mouthful of salt with just a little bit of uh, like pasta sauce on top of it. And so he's like gagging, like about to throw up. And it's just like, and you can tell he's trying to hide it a little bit because like this is what he thinks that she's just giving him some food that she's cooked. And so he's like trying to hide it a little bit, but at the same time he's like, "Mm, mm." and uh, so it's just really funny because his reaction to that much salt was uh, just terrible. Like he hated it and it was awful. But here's the thing. Sometimes the world is going to react like that to us. Sometimes the world will react that way. When we are the salt of the earth and we try to prevent the decay that we see taking place, sometimes the earth and the world and all these people are going to react in a very negative way. But that should be of no surprise to us because Christ has warned us of that over and over again in the scriptures. But regardless, we must maintain our saltiness. Um, (laughs) When I wrote it down, I didn't think of it like that. (laughs) That sounded much better on paper. Um, (laughs) But when we talk about this, we can (laughs) we can equivalate uh, equivalent. Is that even a word? I'm sorry, guys. (laughs) The equivalent of saltiness is Christ-likeness. There we go. That's where I was trying to get. Um, but so, so we must maintain our Christ-likeness. Uh, no matter what goes on um, in the world, we must maintain our Christ-likeness. Because here, here's what this says. If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Right? Like if, if, if salt loses its taste, if salt loses its saltiness, then it's worth nothing. Right, it says it's only good to be thrown on the ground and trampled under people's feet. Now, 
Um, the chemistry majors in here might be looking at me going, no, sodium chloride is a stable compound. It is not going to lose its saltiness. Um, <laughs> and I get that, but it can be contaminated, right? It can be contaminated when it gets mixed with all of these other things. And so uh, one of the things that scholars, as I was doing my research, one of the things that biblical scholars think Jesus was kind of referring to in this is uh, they believe that around the Dead Sea, kind of in that area, uh, there would be like big areas covered in like this white dust. Um, and so essentially what that was is of contaminated salt. So like sodium chloride was in it, like salt was in it, but so was a ton of other stuff. And because everything else was in it and, and had contaminated the sodium chloride, it no longer tasted like salt and it no longer acted like salt, right? It, it no longer did its job. It was called salt probably, but it wasn't really salt. And so that's what this is trying to guard us against. But, but I think that sometimes we can get caught up in the metaphors and the illustrations and everything, but we have to just focus on the point. What Jesus was trying to say is this. Don't lose your Christian identity. Don't lose your Christ-likeness. This is more about morality than it is about science. Jesus wasn't trying to be scientific. He was trying to talk about morality and identity. So here's what we have to do. We have to do what we can to preserve goodness. That means that we have to stand on the Scriptures we have to stand on whatever this book says, whatever the Bible says, I'm going to stand on that because it is the truth and it does not change. The opinions uh, of culture will change constantly, but what the scriptures say will not. So we stand on that. And we have to stand up for what is righteous and stand up against what is unrighteous. But we also, sometimes preserving goodness means correcting our friends. Sometimes uh, preserving goodness means correcting other people. Now, for those of you who are um, not good with confrontation, uh, that scares you, and that's okay. But that does not mean that we shy away from it. And now there are some of you that love confrontation, and you're like, oh yeah, I'm ready to go correct everybody. You did this wrong, you did this wrong. And we have to remember there as well that we have to do this. It's, in, it's imperative that we do this, that we correct people, but it is also imperative that we do it in love. It is also imperative that we are compassionate and that we are loving and that we are gentle with people when we correct them. So we have to maintain that balance to do this in love. But also, so we need to do what we can to preserve goodness in the world publicly. We also need to do what we can to preserve goodness in us privately. Do everything you can to grow in your Christ-likeness instead of becoming deluded by all of the things of the world. Because you don't want to lose your Christ-likeness. Your identity as a Christian Right, this, this is what we have to hold is our identity as a Christian. We have to never let anything take it from us, but we also cannot let anything dilute it. Your identity as a Christian involves your morals. It involves your character. It involves your theology. It involves your attitude. It involves your word choices. It involves the jokes you make. It involves every bit of everyday life. So if you were to look at these things, if you were to look at your morals, your character, your theology, your attitude, and your word choice, do those things set you apart from the world? Do those things make you different than the world? Or do those things look strikingly similar to what everybody else is doing? Because if they are, then there's a chance that we may lose our Christ-likeness and that we may become useless on our mission to glorify God. So we have to guard ourselves against that. Let me tell you the best way to guard yourself against your Christian identity, your saltiness, your Christ-likeness. Let me tell you the best way to guard yourself against that being diluted. And it is this. Let the Bible be the biggest influence in your life. Let it be what impacts you most. But here's another challenge. Let it be what you spend the most time in. 
This is something that the Lord has really been working on me and teaching me recently that I need to be spending more time uh, in his word, learning about him, doing things that are going to be productive in me spiritually than I spend doing whatever else, right? Like watching TV or playing video games or doing all this other stuff. What needs to be central, what needs to be most influential on my life is the word of God. And so, hey, maybe that means you got a long drive, you pull up, you listen to a sermon instead of listening to music for 45 minutes. All right, or there are audio Bible apps you can listen to. And there, there are things that you can do throughout your everyday life where you would usually be listening to uh, regular music or watching normal TV shows or anything like that. There are things that you can do to lessen the influence that those have on you and to increase the influence of the Bible in your life. Let me tell you another thing that can influence us that we need to guard ourselves against is social media. This is something that I mentioned earlier, but recently I put timers on my social media. So there's only a certain limit of time that I can be on it per day. And so I, I set those at 30 minutes. And so most days my goal is if that timer runs out, that app is shut down. So I know that I spent 30 minutes on social media today. Well, my goal is to spend 31 minutes in the Word or 35 minutes in the Word, or as long as I can in the Word, so that that is influencing me more than anything else is. We have to make that a priority if we want to maintain our Christ-likeness. And then if we want to take that a step further, not just maintain it, but grow in it, we have to spend time letting the Bible be the biggest influence on our lives. Now, responsibility number three Responsibility number three is this, encourage human flourishing. Encourage human flourishing. Um, now, this is kind of the concept uh, that I'm gonna be speaking through here is that obedience to God leads to joy and satisfaction. The obedience to God leads to joy and satisfaction. Right, the guidelines, the commands that God has given us to do this or don't do this, those things are for our good. Those things are so that we may have life and we may have it more abundantly. Those things are for our good. Now let me kind of define uh, this term human flourishing because uh, this may not be something that all of you guys are familiar with. Human flourishing is, it, it involves happiness, yes, but it goes far beyond that. It also involves uh, overall well-being. It involves satisfaction in life and a sense of purpose. Now, human flourishing is when all those things are as positive as they can possibly be. Like, it, it's the top. It's the best of all of those things. It is where the most joy is found, where we are best off in our lives, it is where we are most satisfied, and it is where we feel the greatest sense of purpose. Now, that doesn't mean life is easy. When I say that obedience to God leads to human flourishing, that does not mean that life is a cakewalk and there's nothing that's ever going to affect you or hinder you. I don't mean that. But what I mean is that it will be genuinely satisfying. That life will be genuinely satisfying when you are flourishing as a human. And here, this is, we're talking now about verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, um, but on a sand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Satisfaction is part of the light that this is talking about. Human flourishing is part of the light that this passage is talking about. Satisfaction, human flourishing, and truth. A lot of times light in the scriptures is used as a, a reference to or an illustration for truth. And so what we learn from that is that this is both a uh, it, but it plays out, us being the light of the world plays out in how well we flourish as a human, but it also plays out in how well we proclaim the word of God, how often we proclaim the word of God, how joyful we are and eager we are to proclaim the word of God and to share the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I want to talk about two things 
uh, about light that are evident in this passage. And so remember, this light is satisfaction in God, human flourishing, and it is sharing the truth of the gospel. So two things about light. Uh, The first one from verse 14, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Light is impossible to hide. Our Christian identity is impossible to hide. Think of this imagery um, that Jesus is using. Imagine yourself, you're walking through a dark valley. You're in a mountain range. It's nighttime. You're walking through this dark valley. You don't see any civilization. You don't see any water. You don't see any food sources. You don't see anything except just dark mountains and the landscape around you. But then all of a sudden, you, you round a corner and you look up. From the top of a hill, you see a beaming light. And that's all you can see. Right, that, that's obviously civilization. That's obviously a city set on a hill. It can't do anything to hide itself. It's sitting there, it's out in the open, and it's going to attract attention because it's the only light in this valley of darkness. That's what our Christian identity must be is that kind of light. Human flourishing can't be covered up. The gospel can't be covered up when it is truly loved and rejoiced in. And when human flourishing genuinely takes place, it can't be covered up because it's how God designed us to function. The next thing, it is foolish to hide light. Think of the imagery here in verse 15. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to everyone who's in the house. All right, think about this. Uh, You go over to a friend's house, and you know, you're just kind of hanging out. Uh, You walk in, and they've got this lamp with like a huge weighted blanket over it. All right, it's like a blackout, like you can't see anything. So you walk in, and you watch your friend walk over, flip the switch on that light, and just kind of walk away. Right, like, they look dumb, let's be honest. Like, they look dumb if they just walk over there, they flip that, because you expect them to like grab, you know, grab that blanket off so that you can see, uh, but they don't do that, they just leave it. Right, they, they look foolish to do that. But here's the thing, we look foolish when we try to blend in with the rest of the world. And we don't look foolish to the world when we try to do that, but we're fools in the eyes of God. Because we have not owned our Christian identity. We have not owned the grace that he has given us and the mission that he has given us to be different. So we must own that. Now here's what that means. That Christians should lead by example in having the healthiest lifestyles. Because if we are flourishing as humans, we will have the healthiest lifestyles. I'm not necessarily talking about uh, how much you work out and how you eat right. I'm talking about lifestyle as a whole being healthy. All right, that means your friendships are healthy because you are a loyal and a faithful person. You are an honest and a forgiving person. All right, our friendships should be the closest and the, the best and what other people desire their friendships to be like. As Christians, that's how we should engage and that's how we should expect our friendships to go. Because if we truly are the light of the world, then we have to lead in this area. Same thing with our attitudes. Right? We should lead in having good attitudes as Christians. I'll never forget there was this one day when the guy that led me to Christ, his name was Dean, um, and he was, he was a trainer that I had and we worked out together all the time, but after our workouts all the time, he would just sit down and just talk with me about the gospel. Um, and so like, he's the one that led me to Christ, discipled me whole nine yards. I'll never forget that one day I, I came into the gym and I was having a really bad day. Like some stuff at school had happened. This is when I was in high school. Some stuff at school had happened. Some stuff with football had happened. And that was pretty much my life at that point. Um, so I was really upset. And so I walk into the gym and I'm just like, shooting off complaints, like, well, this happened today, this happened today, this happened today, and like, my head's just down, and so what Dean did was he said, okay, hey, come over here with me. The whiteboard that he wrote our workouts on, he just erased everything that was on it, 
And he drew out for me a diagram of the cross. And he explained to me in depth what Jesus went through for my sake. He explained in depth the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured so that I could have salvation. And I I remember vividly him drawing the cross and drawing Jesus on the cross on this whiteboard and explaining to me all of the pain and suffering that he went through. And it's just like a light bulb went off in my head. And it said, if Christ did this for you, if Christ went through all of this for you, why are you letting things that are so temporary, so negatively affect your attitude? So we must lead in this way. Now, I will be the first to admit, I don't always do that very well. I don't always do that very well. But here's the thing. I have to make the effort to lead by example in that area. And you as Christians do as well. The next one also, our our practice of sex and our view of purity. We must lead by example in this way as well. Because, I mean, you can see the negative effects that just sexual immorality has on has on people. All right, if, if you look at the world today, you can see how that just caused people to lack fulfillment and lack joy and lack all of these good things. So we ought to confine sex to the context of marriage, and then in doing that, we are most satisfied in it. All right, and we are able to glorify God by doing that. Also, our relationship with money. If we are good stewards of our money and treat it well, we don't give in to greed, we don't give in to indulging in materialism, but instead we use our money uh, to glorify God and we use our money as a tool to serve him, that's when we will have the best relationship with it, right? We won't be obsessed with everything. When we get into our career and someone asks us how we're doing or what we've been up to, our response will not be chasing the dollar, because that's a response that you will hear very often, but that's not a fulfilling life. Because you might chase the dollar, but you're never going to catch it. You're never going to have enough of it. But if we view our money in a biblical sense and steward it and use it as a tool for God's glory, then we will be able to find fulfillment in it. And also marriages. Right? We, we ought to lead, as Christians, we ought to lead the charge in successful, God-glorifying marriages. Right? The divorce rates are through the roof. But we, as Christians, must treat marriages as what they are, and that is a covenant with God. That's something that can't be broken. We're going to talk about marriage in a couple weeks uh, because it's in here in the Sermon on the Mount. But we ought to lead the charge with successful marriages as Christians. Because we know how it's supposed to function. It's laid out clearly for us in the scriptures what a biblical marriage is supposed to look like. So we ought to lead the charge in healthy, successful marriages. We ought to lead the charge in healthy and uplifting speech. The conversations that we have with people ought to be seasoned with scripture and with wisdom and love. And therefore, they are encouraging and lifting up people and bringing their attitudes up. So here's the charge. Go act like the light of the world. Go act like what you are. You are a city on a hill. Now, that means that people are watching you. If you claim the name of Christ, people are watching your actions to see what you display. Because one of the first things they're looking for as an excuse not to get involved in Christianity is, I know so many Christians that are hypocrites. And so if they look at us and they see that, if they look at us and they see no regard for the things of God, no effort uh, to glorify Him, then they're going to have all the ammunition that they could possibly want to stay out of church and to stay out of Christianity. So we must be reminded of the fact that people are watching us. People are paying attention to the way that we live. So let us do it in a way that glorifies God and that illuminates everything that is around us with the hope of the gospel. Encourage human flourishing, right? So live it out yourself. Lead by example 
and then also teach others to follow that example. That was Paul's whole thing when he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's exactly what Paul was trying to do. He was trying to live a life of obedience to God that leads to human flourishing and then teach others to do the same thing. Paul was being the light of the world. That's our example to do it. And all of this, we have one motivation for all of this and it's found in verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our one motivation to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world is the glory of God. That's what this is all about. That's what this life is all about. Your life is not about you. Your life is about glorifying God. When we understand that, oh my goodness, there is freedom and there is joy and there is hope. Because our lives aren't about us. So we have so much motivation to be obedient. We have so much motivation to be faithful to him. It's all about glorifying him. So be so salty and be so luminescent that people have to blame God. Like they have to look at what you do and say, well, there's no way that this person would just decide to do that on, like, on their own. But there has to be something else that inspired them to do that. And that's when they see it's the Lord. And I, I intentionally used the word that people have to blame God because some people are going to view that as negative. And that's okay. They're not God. So that's fine. So I, I want to close with this, and worship team, y'all can make your way back up here. I want to address a, a few thoughts that some of you may be having. Uh, so the first one of those thoughts is you may be sitting there thinking, I don't know how I'm supposed to be the salt of the earth. I don't know how I'm supposed to be the light of the world with all of the stuff that I've done in the past. With all of the junk that I have behind me, I don't know how on earth Christ could call me the salt of the earth. I don't know how on earth he could say that I'm the light of the world. Now let me encourage you. If that is your thought process, I can guarantee you this. You have not out the grace of God. Remember that passage from Ephesians chapter 2 that we talked about earlier? What did verses 1 and 2 say? It said, for you were dead in your trespasses and sins. All right, it, it, it blatantly states out, this is where you were. It doesn't skip over that part. This is who this is for. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. That's who the gospel's for. It's not for the people who have, uh, who have never screwed up. The gospel is for those people who are dead in their trespasses and sins. Jesus doesn't run away from that. He looks at it. And he cleanses you of it. Ephesians chapter 2 very well recognizes your past. And it very well pulls you out of it. And it very well cleanses you from it. And it very well describes that you are a new creation in Christ. Right? Like, Christ totally acknowledges he is fully aware and not at all intimidated by your past because he already conquered it. Right? He, he died so that he could conquer it, so that he could conquer it. He died so he could conquer it, and then he resurrected to prove that he did conquer it. Right? That's over with. That's done. His grace is sufficient to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So if that's what you're thinking right now, I want you to cast that thought as far from your brain as you can. And I want you to fling yourself on the mercy of God and be encouraged because he offers forgiveness. Now here's another thing that you may be thinking, um, or another thing that, that I want to just kind of address is if you're in here and you don't believe in God, 
Like you, you don't think that the Bible is true. You don't think that any of this is worth anything. If you're in here tonight and that is your mindset towards Christianity, I want to let you know that human flourishing is only possible through the gospel. Human flourishing is only possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ as he saves and then sanctifies us. That is the only context in which we will flourish as we are meant to flourish. So if tonight you have never believed in God, you can begin doing that tonight. It will lead to a life of human flourishing. Again, that doesn't mean that everything is going to be easy and nothing's ever going to be difficult, but that does mean that you will be genuinely satisfied in Christ. You will be saved from your sin. You will be given hope for eternity in Jesus Christ because he died for your sin and because he resurrected for your salvation. So you can begin a relationship with God tonight. You can also mend a relationship with God tonight. If some of the things from this passage, if some of the things from this sermon have really pricked your heart and God has used it to convict and correct you, you can mend a relationship with him as well. Because he does not just forgive those who aren't saved, but he graciously welcomes those who are his children as well. He corrects you only out of his love for you. So here's what what I'm going to ask. If you need to respond to this message tonight, and if, if you need to spend some time praying, if you need anyone to pray with you or to explain anything further to you, uh, we're going to have some of my leadership team is going to be down here um, beside the stage. So if you need any of that, come talk with one of us. We would love to pray with you. We would love to lead you to a relationship with the Lord because that's what this whole thing is about. But most of you guys have heard me say this a thousand times and you'll hear me say it a thousand more. To passively hear the word of God is to actively reject it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your grace and I thank you for this passage of scripture that is so encouraging to us because you have given us a new identity in Christ. But I also thank you that it is weighty because you have given us responsibility. And God, I I pray that each of the people in here would be conformed more and more to the image of your son. God, I, I pray that they would respond to this message tonight, but God, I pray also that they would respond to it tomorrow and they would respond to it the day after that and every day for the rest of their lives that they would go out with intentionality to be the salt and the light of this world. God, I pray that if anyone needs boldness to to come forward and to to talk and to pray with somebody, I pray that you bless them with that. God, I just pray that you're glorified through us uh, in this time of worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.
So again, I want to say thank you all for being here. Um, have a couple announcements as we uh, wrap up tonight. Um, so the first one is on Sunday mornings, we have our services right in here at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Um, and then we also have a uh, college small group that meets in between those services. So that's from about 10.05 to 10.45 on Sunday mornings. And that classroom is upstairs um, at the far end of the hall, right next to, uh, there's a big room at the end of the hall. It's right on the other side of the door to that room. Uh, so we would love to see you guys for that. Um, that class is being taught by Dalton and Ava Bowman. Uh, a lot of you guys probably know them. They were recently in our college ministry, um, and they are teaching that, so it's going to be phenomenal. Uh, They're an awesome couple. Um, also, I want to let you guys know about uh, September 11th is Friend Day here at Sherwood, uh, so that's going to be an awesome morning. We're having a guest band come lead us in worship. Um, it's going to be a very evangelistic message, uh, so that's going to be a great opportunity for you to bring your lost friends um, so that they can come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also, this one's a little bit further out in the future. November 5th is Harvest Rome. Uh, this is an event that a lot of the churches in Floyd County are partnering together for. Um, but this is going to be an awesome, uh, it's going to be kind of like a festival fair type thing. There's going to be food trucks, there's going to be vendors, there's going to be live music, um, and the gospel will also be presented at this event. Uh, so be sure just to kind of mark that on your calendar and uh, be praying for it and be anticipating God to do some really cool stuff in our community uh, on that day. So with all of that being said, um, do not forget to go out and to be the salt of the earth and go be the light of the world. Um, I hope that you all were inspired by that tonight and that you all are ready to go to preserve goodness in the world, to be different and to encourage human flourishing. Um, uh, that is my prayer that all of you guys are excited to go and do that. Um, so I'm not going to say that you're dismissed. I'm going to say that you are sent out into the world. So there we go. Thank you.